ladies and instruments in, and I congratulate you all because after worship, this is our Bluegrass Sunday, and after worship we are going to just kind of gather here up front and we'll sing some uh, wonderful bluegrass gospel stuff together for a bit. Uh, if you need to grab some sustenance before you come and join us, that's okay. You would be less than man in the study. No, actually, I fully support it. Um, but yeah, so if you're interested, join us. We'll just have some uh, fun making music together after the service. Um, also, a couple of things that are coming up in this next week. We've got the men's breakfast on Saturday. And then next Sunday after worship, we have a council meeting. So if you're on the elders and deacons, um, we're going to be meeting directly after church in the other building, kind of getting ready for the congregational meeting that's going to be coming up the first Sunday in May. Um, also, we do continue with our Bible verse memorization, and we're at Exodus 20, verse 10 today. Do we have anyone who would like to volunteer to stand and speak Exodus 20, verse 10? Or 2 through 10, if you want to do all of the verses. Yeah. Any takers? Okay, all right, so Judah, Judah stands, speak it loudly. All of them. No, no, just do verse 10. I know. <laughs> all of them. I, I, and I know that. And maybe when we get to the end of the Ten Commandments, we'll have all of the people that have memorized all the Ten Commandments come forward, hint, 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 and say them all together because it's a good encapsulation of the moral will of God. So, Judah, what is verse 10? But the Sabbath day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work, you or your or your or your or the Bravo. So guys, gals, of whatever age, if an eleven year old can do it. I <laughs> can. Uh you know I'm sorry? Who said I can't? Okay. Excellent. Yes, all of you can. All right. Yes. Would it be more like it's in the bulletin like last week? Would you do it that way? Oh. Well, I mean, does that have to be word perfect? It depends what your parent is telling you. So, since your parent is telling you, for me, with Judah, I made him do it word perfect because my parents made me do it word perfect. And I had to go across the street to Grandpa's house and recite to him word perfect. And if it wasn't exactly word perfect, I didn't get credit for it. So, but you can do whatever you would like. <laughs> Excellent. Something is better than nothing, right? Precisely. Very good. Very good. Any other questions? Yes, Shelly. Yeah. Well, speaking of work perfect, we're getting ready to update the directory. Oh, so, do cool. you have any changes to your information that you like in there? I have um, sheets like this out there on the table to you can fill out. And if you are not in the directory and would like to be, please fill this out and we'll get that in. Good. Wonderful. That's, that's awesome. Okay, step in. Mine is not church related, but there is there has been a fair meeting date picked, and I placed all the information on the bulletin board so you can find it there. Excellent. And by the fair, it's for those of you who don't know, it's the fair for the home goods like baking something, canning, cooking, and then there's some agriculture stuff. So if you're interested, it's on the bulletin board. Slaughtering rabbits, is that part of it? Uh, no, it's oh. showing on it. <laughs> you can create textiles out of the pelts and then they that's one of them. Yes, they be. Blue? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yes. So, Les Cowan, <laughs> we're so glad to have you with us this morning. We've been praying for you and your wife. <laughs> And we will continue to do so. I know it's been a, a tough time. But, uh, I'm glad you're here with us. We're so glad you're here. Yeah. Um, any other announcements? Then let us prepare to worship with the prayer. <laughs>
Please stand now for the call to worship, Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go out mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth, let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your love. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the fire of God my God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Holy God, for I shall again praise him. My salvation and my God. Let us rejoice in that God together, the victory that we have in Jesus by turning in your hymnal to 353. Let us rejoice together.
May Jesus be exalted in our lives yes. and through our lips. In his yes. name we pray. And may our worship this morning be pleasing to you. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet one another in the Lord.
that you allow us to be to our neighbors, to our family, to our friends, Lord. Um, I thank you especially for Kathy, Nurse Kathy, Lord. Um, it, she ministers um, through your strength and your um, indwelling Holy Spirit and her work in the women's prison. And I, I just thank you that people do see a difference in her will give her opportunities uh, to voice what you have done and what you desire to do in in others' lives, Lord, who are broken and desperate. Lord, I'd like to pray for my blood test they just did. May they come back quickly and it be the lesser of the two things that could be causing all the issues I'm having, Lord. Lord, I'd like to pray for my own Warren, who's always been a very steadfast um, person in our family through a lot of uh, 
difficult things. And he's just suffered a stroke, and I pray that he has a good recovery. He's just with us for uh, quite a bit more time, just having such a good influence in the family. Yeah. Father, I just um, thank you so much for being here and being able to worship you today, Lord, and my husband and my brothers and sisters. That is such a blessing. I thank you, Lord, for the precious time the ladies had on Saturday, just loving on each other and encouraging each other and learning more about you, Lord, and the word from the book of James. It was just a sweet time of fellowship, and I thank you for that, Lord. And I love that hymn we just sang about um, we need people, our brothers and sisters, to pray for us. And um, this is my prayer for my brothers and sisters from the back. Just thinking about the tough times this world is in and all of those things, this is my prayer. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vine, though the yield of the olive tree should fail, and the fields produce no fruit. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I pray that we will rejoice and exult in you, Yahweh, and I pray that we will rejoice in the God of our salvation. The Lord, Yahweh, you are our strength, and you have made our feet like hinds feet, and you make us walk on high places. And even though we're going through difficult times, each one of us has different situations come into our lives. Lord, may we be strengthened with joy and peace in the midst of those things that the world doesn't understand, that it's your peace. We have a faith that is supernatural. Just the very fact that we can believe in you and call upon your name is a gift from you, Lord. Lord, may you be exalted today in our worship and may you Lift up Pastor John as he's preaching from your word, Lord. May you speak to our souls, Lord, and comfort us with hope and just joy in you in the midst of things. I know it's a difficult passage that he's going to be praying, uh, preaching on, and I just pray you'd be with him and that your spirit would just encourage us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear, dear Lord, I just pray for our nephew, Wade, Ohio. But sometimes it's just so hard to be far away, and right now each of them can use the comfort. God, I pray for my dad who just lost his, um, his sister and buried her. They buried her in Nigeria just a few days ago, and he has one sibling left, and he seems to be struggling. God, just come and comfort him and bring him joy, um, even though this is hard things. I pray for my mom's health. We're not sure what happened, but we've gone backwards. Just strength and peace with that, Lord. Pray for Mecca. She's had the flu and she recovers. And I pray for Maya who is just, Lord, Lord, please help Maya. Yes. My heart just hurts for her. Mm -hmm. She needs to know you. She doesn't know you. And I feel like you're reaching out to her. She's just been going through so many things. And now it's a mysterious rash that won't go away. It's like you're bringing her to her knees. Just help her reach out and just grab that hand and come back. Yes. In the name of prayer, amen. Yes. Yes. Let's let us close together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I can call forward the ushers of this time to receive the offer.
please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come bearing gifts. We come bearing gifts to you who is the great king over all the earth. And this is your due. Mm -hmm. Not just these gifts, but our very lives. Mm -hmm. But these gifts are our token. That yes, we belong to you, we love you, and we want to see your kingdom flourish in this world. And frankly, you use our money to do it. Mm -hmm and our obedience, and our faith, and our worship. May you be pleased with these offerings that we give, and may they, in fact, bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Please turn with me your scriptures to Colossians chapter Three, verse 22 through chapter 4, verse 1. And some of you weren't here last week. And so you didn't get the joy of being made completely uncomfortable. In <laughs> so you can watch last week's sermon online if you like. But just because I like to be equal opportunity, any of you who are here will also be equally uncomfortable today. <laughs> Colossians 3, 22 through 4, 1. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work hardly as for the Lord, and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality masters. Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. <clears throat> Slavery is a blight on our human existence. Slavery is a stain on our American history. Slavery is a scar on our Christian conscience, especially since the advent of the transatlantic slave trade. There is no getting around it. It was unconscionable. It was inexcusable. Even for those who insisted they found credence for it in the scriptures and defended its practice from the scriptures because even if, notably, so-called Christian slave owners in early America, even if they had simply towed the line that the Apostle Paul drew right here, let alone all the other lines that the Lord has drawn earlier in the scriptures, let's just play devil's advocate and argue worst case scenario from any scriptural warrant, even if they just did this, then there would never <coughs> have been such a horrible scenario as that which we found promulgated in the American colonies and early states. The grievously horrific and grievingly ironic testimony of Frederick Douglass, an African American born into slavery, who thankfully escaped into freedom and helped spur on and advance the abolitionist movement. The personal testimony of Frederick Douglass in My Bondage and My Freedom is that the worst slaveholders, I mean, this was shocking for me to read. I would invite any of you to pick up this book and just read it through. The worst slaveholders, the ones who treated their African slaves most unchristianly, were their so called Christian masters. And not just faking Christians, taking the name but not playing the part but outwardly pious in every other respect, but just treating their slaves as nothing but property to be used and abused at will. 
I want to just read from his first-hand account. This is just one instance of his testimony. Uh, among the many advantages gained in my change from Covey's to Freeland's, uh, different masters, startling as the statement may be was the fact that the latter gentleman made no profession of religion. I assert most unhesitatingly, and he puts that in italics, <laughs> that the religion of the South, as I have observed it and proved it, is a mere covering for the most horrid crimes, the justifier of the most appalling barbarity, a sanctifier of the most hateful frauds, and a secure shelter under which the darkest, foulest, grossest, and most infernal abominations fester and flourish, were I again to be reduced to the condition of a slave Next to that calamity, I should regard the fact of being a slave over, of a religious slaveholder the greatest calamity that could befall me. For of all slaveholders with whom I have ever met, religious slaveholders are the worst. I have found them almost invariably the vilest, meanest, and basest of their class. Exceptions there may be, but this is true of religious slaveholders as a class. And he puts that in emphasis as well. It is not for me to explain the fact. Others may do that. I simply state it as a fact and leave the theological and psychological inquiry which it raises to be decided by others more competent than myself. Religious slaveholders, like religious persecutors, are ever extreme in their malice and violence. Very near my new home, on an adjoining farm, there lived the Reverend Daniel Wheaton, who was both pious and cruel. After the real Covey pattern, Mr. Whedon was a local preacher of the Protestant Methodist persuasion and a most zealous supporter of the ordinances of religion generally. This Whedon <coughs> owned a woman called Siao, so let's make a particular instance, who was a standing proof of his mercilessness. Poor Siao's back, always scantily clothed, was kept literally raw by the lash of this religious man and gospel minister the most notoriously wicked man, so called in distinction from church members, could hire hands more easily than this brute. When sent out to find a home, a slave would never enter the gates of the preacher we, while a sinful sinner needed a hand. Behave ill or behave well, it was the known maxim of Whedon that it is the duty of a master to use the lash. If for no other reason he contended that this was essential to remind a slave of his condition, and of his master's authority. The good slave must be whipped to be kept good, and the bad slave must be whipped to be made good. Such was Whedon's theory, and such was his practice. The back of his slave woman will, in the judgment, be the swiftest witness against him. And yet, the Apostle Paul says something directly contrary to that right here, at least, to Christian slave holders, so the sting of the indictment is all the more severe. And even all the way back into the earliest pages of the Old Testament, God had regulated the ever-present practice of enslavement in some form, though it almost never was nearly as bad as it was in early America under Christian leadership and ownership. Ouch. And this thing is well earned and should cause us to react with absolute and utter revulsion, plain and simple, nothing more. God had said all the way back in Exodus 21, 16, that whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. Well, that would have put a huge damper on, if not outright stop to the African slave trade in the Americas, wouldn't it? If we, speaking of, of American Christian slave owners and those sympathetic to the practice, would have simply listened to that clear word. And God said again all the way back in Exodus 21, just a few verses later, that if you mistreat a slave, such that you break even a tooth, that slave 
as far as himself receiving just compensation because even a slave is a human being made in the image of God and thus bearing and deserving any dignity. He's not just a tool to be used as such as Aristotle is said to have described as them. If you were to even break one of his teeth, you were to set him free. Just compensation. Exodus 21, 27. This is elevating. This is liberating in a world dominated by slavery. On a trajectory to eliminate slavery. Remember too that Exodus, in Exodus, God is addressing those, his own people, en masse, whom he had just miraculously and astoundingly delivered from slavery. That's the trajectory we're on. And that we're on, even as Paul is addressing the continuance of slavery right here. Why does he do that? Why did he just lambast the system and throw it all out? That's what we might want and what we might expect, but he doesn't. And yet, if only American Christians would have followed these rules encapsulated right here, just blatantly as, as is, without even following the trajectory to where they inevitably and thankfully lead, if only they had simply followed these simple regulations of that thoroughgoing practice, then the horrors of Negro slavery and even post-slavery, remember your American history, with its content, Continue. With its continued prejudice and discrimination and segregation, all of it racism, and all of which is not just unchristian, it is in fact anti Christian. If only they had followed these basic instructions at face value rather than following the spirit of the age and their own sinful wants and comforts and power, all dressed up in Christianized guise, but rotten at the core nonetheless, then none of this would have happened. And the history and legacy of this nation would be very different indeed. One instance of this legacy and of the gospel's transformation that can still continue to change things very concretely in our continuing times. I want to mention the name Tony Evans. Many of you know him, or at least know of him. Solid, biblical, evangelical, Bible preacher and teacher, president of the Urban Alternative and senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas. I have the privilege of attending his church on one occasion while I was studying down there. And he showed me an uncommon example of what true and good and serious church discipline looked like. It was my first visit, and he stands before the congregation and issues some sobering news. One of the deacons was continuing in unrepentant adultery. And they had gone through all of the steps, and now he was issuing a proclamation or a declaration to the whole church, you may no longer treat this man as a brother. Sobering words, but spot on according to our Lord's own dictum, and gave me a lot of respect for that man. And the Lord has used him and continues to use him in areas of racial reconciliation within the Christian community, particularly as in many other things. God bless him. One of the experiences from his past that he has shared is that earlier in his career, he was in Atlanta with his wife, and they went to a white church. Now, just as a side, the fact that we have white churches and black churches is our sin. We set it up. Read some first-hand accounts, for example. We would not have these issues today if we had acted more Christian. All right. They go to Atlanta, he and his wife. They go to a white church, but the deacons let him know. Now, this was a fundamental, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church 
He's, he says the deacons told us that we were not welcome there. We could believe in their God, but we could not worship at their church. They said the church voted. And the church decided that it would be the stance of their church that blacks were not welcome there. And he explained, this happened to me, he explained. And he was tempted at that point to become bitter and to walk a different path as so many understandably have done. But through righteous influences in his life, he didn't. And he goes on to say, that church called me up last year and said, that although it's been 15 or 20 years since that event happened, our church wants to let you know that we sinned. We apologize. And would you come back and preach for us? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's where we need more and more. And by the way, that's on his The Sins of Racism Part 1 podcast. Well worth your time. But coming back to these verses before us, what is going on here? What is Paul doing? And why? Well, fundamentally, what <laughs> jumps out and screams for our attention <laughs> is this. For both masters and slaves, there is a Lord focus, and it's Lord throughout. Stemming once again from verse 17 just above, which we looked at last week, and that connects directly to all of these larger household instructions. Now, we didn't look at it last week, but it, we noted how it extends to all of these larger household instructions. If you're going to look back up at verse 17, it says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And where that connects directly with our verses this morning is certainly in the whatever you do, that phrase popping up, repeated, and thus correlated, tied here at the opening of verse 23, but also in both distinctly and distinctively conspicuously in the thoroughgoing repetition of Lord, picking up on and fleshing out this whole whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is for him and to honor him. I can point you back to chapter 2, verse 6 as well, where it says, similarly foundational. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. And I would like us now to walk through and notice all of this Lord repetition, this Lord focus, beginning at verse 22, bond servants or slaves. Right? I'm going to use the terms interchangeably throughout. Different translations render the Greek term slightly differently, though there's an undercurrent of commonality. Whether that person is an indentured servant that is under contract for a set period of time where he can have a certain security and from which he can earn some wages and pay off debt, or a bond servant who can ultimately gain his freedom, which many did, or, or potentially remain for life if his master was good and kind, or an abject slave with no rights and no hope. In all cases, the person is owned by, the, by, by another is in a status well below that other and is duty-bound to obey the other. We'll touch on those aspects again when we look at application today. Okay, continuing in. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly lords. Okay, baldly, literally lords, but clearly with the specific nuance given the context here of masters, which is why it's rendered in most translations as masters. But I just want you to notice it is the same Greek word, Lord. So it continues, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Verse 23, whatever you do, work hardly as for the Lord and not for men. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward and continuing you are serving 
the Lord Christ. Down slightly in the chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, again, it's the plural of this same word, lords. Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you have a master, a lord in heaven. That's a seven-fold repetition, seven times in six short verses. That's something to clearly take notice of. Okay, well, let's step back and then come back in again. Notice that as he heads this new subsection, he addresses the slaves first, and he addresses the slaves directly. Just like he will address the masters. And again, this is stunning. This is elevating. This is stating something profoundly important. This is planting seeds of something dignifying and ultimately liberating. Just like how directly before, we looked at this last week, when we dealt with the nuclear family unit, he addressed the kids directly as well. Just as he had directly addressed the moms and the dads, this was not just unexpected, this was unheard of. They're not on the same plane. And yet at a fundamental level, they are. In God's order of things, yes, they are below because they are immature and under command but not below in essence at all. And so worthy of being directly and personally addressed just as Jesus did in the Gospels, as we noticed, noted last week. Well, the same thing here. Now he addresses some Christian masters, sure, and that's what we'd expect, and tells them everything they need to know about ordering the lives of their slaves, but who needs to bother with the slaves? Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. That, that's not what he does. Or at least does yet. Or first. First, he addresses the slaves. Not simply as tools or property to be used and abused, but as human beings worthy of being addressed by their Lord. And that's Lord, by the way, with a capital L. Just as much as their human lords, ironically, yet elevated, are worthy of being addressed by their Lord, capital L. And it's that Lord with the capital L. And not the one with the little L who is to be the slaves or the person who is under or under command in any way, we'll look at that in a few moments, who is to be the slave's primary focus, that is paradigm shifting. That is whole life changing. Not just for them, but as templates for the rest of us in so many ways, for us all as well. So Paul says to these bond servants, servants or, or slaves in, in Colossae, as anywhere else, who have become believers, who have aligned their hearts to the Lord, he says this, verse 22, fearing the Lord. Not fearing your earthly Lord, but your heavenly Lord. If you have your eyes and your awe on him, that will change things profoundly. You won't just give your earthly boss or commander. Oh, okay, there I'm teasing things out of it. Only your best when they're looking or to gain their favor and goof off or be lazy or give your least when they're not or when there's no advantage to you. Any people guilty here? Not at all. If your eye and your awe are on the Lord, that will change everything and all the time because then in everything and at all times, you will in fact, verse 23, work heartily because you are working for the Lord. And it's that Lord who will reward you, verse 24, even if you've got no hopes or prospects in your station in life down here. Well, what a, what a wonderful hope that brings. We work, not for some boss or commander's 
well done down here and maybe some nice perk or pay raise or promotion, though those things are nice. Our focus needs to be on that well done, good and faithful servant. And that's the same word for bond servant or slave. Enter into the joy of your master, your Lord, Matthew 25, 21, 23. Which in fact is what he emphasized and underscores at the end of that verse, verse 24, you are serving the Lord Christ. That is, bringing us to this point, yes, you belong to your earthly Lord, your Master. You are to obey your earthly Lord, your Master. But really, you belong to the Lord Christ. And you are to obey the Lord Christ. He is your true Lord. And belonging to Him and obedience to Him is what matters most. And yet, this is where we need to remember the particular commands God gives to each of His particular and precious saints in the station He has allotted them for whatever time He has allotted them. Don't worry about the others, right? We talked about this with regard to husbands and wives and children. Worry about what the Lord says to you, right? And that is, okay, wives be submissive, husbands love, children obey. So here, bond servants obey. An integral part of Christ's supreme overlordship for slaves is to obey your underlord. And in so doing, you aren't actually or primarily serving the master. You are serving the master. And that's a huge and pivotally significant life and perspective change. Let that perspective sink in and begin to change your life. Then he also addresses the masters. Verse 1, chapter 4. Masters. Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. I previously noted that in Paul's instructions here, Christian slaves are just as much worthy of being addressed as their masters. And just as much as a slave has a master whom he serves, he doesn't serve him the master, the Lord Christ. So also, just as much, this earthly master, whom his dutiful slave serves, also has a master whom he serves, this same Lord Christ. If a Christian slaveholder even begins to grasp what this means, and even begins to live it out, Justly and fairly under your master who went to the cross for you? How will that change the entire institution itself and lead to its inevitable eradication? And by the way, that transition verse, verse 25, speaks to both bond servants and masters, even as, as it transitions from the one to the other. Look at that verse. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. Now, we might think that these words belong only to one. You know, and from the slave's perspective, that would be the master. Or the other, because from the master's perspective, that would be the slave. Even though it is capping out the discussion toward slaves, it is also introducing the discussion toward masters. The settled and summary declaration is that they... And yet, as we come to see, and we all are, in verse 24, serving the Lord Christ. Knowing this, really and in truth, puts us all on notice. That verse 25, that transitions, puts us all on notice if we're going from verse 24 into verse 1. God shows no partiality. To either master or slave, to either rich or poor, to either black or white, or you name it. He judges justly. And that's it. 
which means that the wrongdoer, whether that's a master mistreating a slave, or a slave only giving the least whatever he can, or fill in the blank with whoever you are and whatever you're doing, the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. Like I said, this puts us all on notice. There is a judgment day, and the judge is completely just. Which throws us back to, verse 22, sincerity of heart. Fearing the Lord. Because he is truly the only one to fear. Jesus said back in Luke 12, 4 and 5, Do not fear those who kill the body. And after that have nothing more that they can do. But I warn you, whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. I tell you, yes, fear him. It's before him that we all stand and serve. And it is before him that we will all stand and give an account. Okay, so that's the thoroughgoing Lord issue that jumps out and screams at us. Did you see it? Did you hear it? Yeah. Okay, now let's look at this in their context. In the early church, what did this mean? And where would this lead? Well, what did this mean? Slavery in the ancient world was simply the system. It was understood by all and unquestioningly as a given. It's, and you're familiar with the term and what it means, it's the system, and you can't beat the system. It's insurmountable. Not that anyone would even ever think of trying to surmount it. Why? Because the system of slavery was absolutely critical to ancient economies. This was the workforce for good or for ill, often for ill, but the workforce nonetheless. Fully one-third of the Roman Empire's population was slaves. I've heard it said that another third were freedmen who were formerly slaves. That takes up two-thirds of the entire empire right there. Thus, fully one third of Colossi's population, right, the church that we're dealing with here, the city, uh, was likely slaves. And thus, probably one third of the Colossian church's population, the congregation, the membership, was also slaves. In ancient slavery, um, you probably got the sense already, but was not like the slavery of the American Southeast, especially. It was never racially based. At all. And it was often, though not always, for a period of time for which the person under this bond servant relationship could earn enough money to eventually gain his freedom. And so it was even at times voluntarily submitted to as a way of either getting out of debt or getting, getting one step ahead in the world that you wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity for. And if you ever live in cultures of desperate poverty, you understand why there might even be a draw. There is in many poverty, destitute, social cultures and societies today, when we talk about sex slavery, for example, which we'll get to, us, or, or uh, companies that we in the West love to exploit. Right. Still not good, and often quite bad, but certainly not as bad as we <clears throat> in the Christian West made it and supported it and defended it to our shame. Let us never make that kind of sinful mistake again. So it was critical to ancient economies, and it was fully part of ancient households. This, this dynamic was inherent, in, inherently operative, especially in the context of a family household, as we see it addressed here. All of these, continuing from last week into today, are instructions to Christians in the household. Even households now that come into the faith. Okay, now, what do we do? But it's also important to note that although all of these relationships dealt with here in this larger section are addressed as part of the ancient household, part and parcel, 
Not all of these relationships are viewed the same. Such that how you would deal with and address the one, say the master-slave relationship, would and must be the same way you deal with and address the other, the family structure itself. So that if we can throw out or at least massage away the instructions to masters and slaves is no longer relevant or binding in any way, and we can do the same thing to the relationship between husbands and wives, especially that we looked at last week. Not at all. Because, and it's a big because, the relationships of husband, wife, and children that we addressed last week go all the way back to creation and to God's design. From the very beginning, I point you to Genesis 1, 27 and 28. For example, masters and slaves, however, and notably, do not. And as well, as we see from elsewhere, Ephesians 5 and 6, particularly these commands to husbands, wives, and children are grounded in creation and in God's design from the very beginning. Uh, you know, remember Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. And the command to children in Ephesians 6, 2 and 3 is grounded in the Ten Commandments, right? The core of God's moral will for his people. These commands to masters and slaves have no such grounding. Here is simply the thoroughgoing given in society, even as that society is being drawn toward Christ. Okay, so how do we begin to govern this reality? And that's what we see the Lord, through the Apostle Paul, seeking to do right here and in the other places in the New Testament that address this subject. That is to govern this given. To regulate this system in a more Christ-honoring and Lord affirming, and again, that's Lord with a capital L way, and regulated toward its eventual disillusion as a system entirely in it all. That's what we see in the trajectory, especially of the New Testament letters, which shows us where this would lead. And I want to point us in particular, I was toying going other places as well, but my sermon was getting too long, so I cut them out, and I'm just doing one. You'll thank me. Uh, to one very personal letter. In fact, it's the only letter that's written specifically to an individual rather than a church, even though it's for the benefit of the local church and the broader church, and that is the letter to Philemon. Philemon was a Christian slaveholder in this very Colossian church. And he would have received this message to the church as a whole. But Paul had an additional message that he communicated at the same time, particularly to him, because one of Philemon's slaves had run away to the big city, Rome, became converted somehow under Paul's ministry there while under house arrest, and was a huge asset and help to him. However, Paul also knew that he needed to send Onesimus back. Now, that's a whole other story. That would take a lot longer sermon, too. And so he did, sending him with both this letter to the Colossians, as well as this personal letter to his master as well. If you've got your Bibles open, look at Colossians chapter 4, and I want us to notice verses 7 through 9. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Onesimus is caring. This letter has a runaway slip to his master. Okay, but also now turn over to Philemon. If you want. 
where we catch an enlightening glimpse into Paul's own understanding of what the gospel must entail toward this system, surreptitiously but inevitably overturning it. He writes, quote, I appeal to you from my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. That's verse 10. Receive him back, he says, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother. Verse 16. Receive him, he says, as you would receive me. Verse 17. Oh, and also, where he also says, hey, I'll pay all steps. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Closing out with, I know, quote, verse 21. This is his kind of just subtle little message, mm -hmm. but very clearly communicated. Mm -hmm. Closing out with, if you got it, it's verse 21. You see it there? Mm -hmm. I know that you will do even more mm -hmm. than I say. Mm -hmm. Hint, hint, hint. Mm -hmm. God is regulating the system to honor him, even as he sows the seeds for its eventual demise. Okay, but let's not stop there. Let's look at this in our own context as well. What does this mean in our day and age? Well, praise and vigilance, for one, and then some areas of application. Okay, as to praise and vigilance, we can praise. Praise the Lord that the institution of slavery as a whole has been desystematized. It is no longer the, sadly ironic to even admit it, warp and woof of civilization and local, national, and global economics. And also, we can praise God that race-based chattel slavery in particular, for our own history and context, has been abolished. It took a civil war to do so, but it's been abolished. It should have just died to Christian leadership. But we must also stay vigilant. Keep a close eye rather than turning a blind eye. Keep a cl close eye on combating continued and resurgent enslavement. It keeps coming back. Why? Because we want to. We want to exploit other people. We want the comforts and power that this brings us at the expense of other human beings made in the image of God just like me. Whether that's the practical slavery of many overseas companies, like I mentioned, that Western companies exploit. That's being in the system. Or most horrendously, sex slavery. And I, and I know some families sell their daughters into sex slavery so that they can have food to eat. Shame is not on the families that do what they feel they must to survive. Shame comes on those that even have a market for it. And then those who exploit that market for their own ends. But sex slavery right now is rampant in our world and we cannot simply be okay with that or happily ignore or pretend it doesn't exist and it exists right under our noses by the way in our land yes. nor can we be okay with the abuse of any relationship where there is this structure and sense of under and under command because at that point you are in the vulnerable position and easily exploited and we can never be okay with that Okay, but now let's look at the closest analogies to this practice and the implications of this teaching in our own lives. Because actually the closest analogy for us today to this bond-servant-master relationship is actually, some of you have served, the military. Right? It gives you the best and easiest connection to what the structure and relationship of bond, servant, and master was for so many in the ancient world. Just like then in the military, you serve for a clear time frame. And once you're signed up for that entire time frame, you are not your own. You are owned. They own you. And there's a clear chain of command where you are below that you must not and you cannot break. You do what they say, you go where they tell you, you have no choice but to obey. So there are clear and direct times. 
Ah, but not in the church. I want to just take a little brief detour here. Because it's germane. And part of how we are to evaluate and interact with this issue as a believer and as a believing community. So, for example, if a soldier and his commanding officer belonged to the same church, were attending and serving and worshiping in the same congregation, they would not function in that context as superior and subordinate. They would interact as equals as who they truly are in Christ. In fact, the commanding officer would likely end up serving his soldier, and the soldier may in fact potentially lead his commanding officer until they go back out into the world, and then it's, yes, sir. Same thing if you and your boss were to attain, attend the same church. He isn't your boss here. He is your brother. Oh. And that begins to really and radically change things, just like it was intended to do with Philemon and Onesimus that we just re referred to from this very church that is receiving these commands. That's what it would have been like between masters and slaves in the same church back then. But the most widely applicable analogy today, directly correlated, though certainly not precise, is still the workforce and the employer-employee relationship. I don't want to belabor this. Uh, got that. But just to speak briefly, I, it's the dad thing. I, when I was writing this out, I did it without even knowing it. I looked back and go, that was, that was awesome. <laughs> Those of you who are dads, I know appreciate it. The rest of you just hate it. My you son. Me. Yes, I know. Okay. For employees. Obey whatever your boss tells you, provided it doesn't conflict with whatever your true boss tells you. You know, remember that principle from last week? You submit to the higher Lord. But don't do it, or, or, or whatever you do at work, in order to get noticed by your boss, to please your boss, to get an in with your boss, to get perks and promotions and pay raises from your boss, or only doing the most when he's got his eye on you and doing the least when he doesn't, or doing the whole quiet quitting thing. That's not what the Lord wants from any of us. Because we're not serving Him. We're serving Him. And you would never quiet quit on Jesus with Him. We give it our best. We do it from a sincere heart. Asking God to help us here because I know we all need help with this just as Christian slaves did back then even more. And we do it wholeheartedly. Not for the boss, but for the real boss. Because that's really who we're working for regardless of what the job or who the boss here is. Okay, and for employers. Don't squeeze out everything you can from your workers or pay them the least that you have to so that you can keep more for yourself or demand time from them that is not yours to justly, fairly take. You might be the boss, the CEO even, but you've got a CEO who's well over you and he keeps scrupulous account. But we could broaden these issues and applications farther out as well into whatever we need to do that we do that is a supervisory on the one hand or into whatever we do that is of service to another. For one simple example, doing the dishes. Do you ever think of doing the dishes for Jesus? Wouldn't you happily, heartily do them for Jesus? I mean, that changes things radically. I know it changes what it means for me when I'm facing the mundane, even the dishes. And, and dishes, by the way, are not gender specific. Dishes can be washed just as easily by men as women. Can you tell my husband that? <laughs> like him to know. You know, we can explore this. I'll get him on the phone. Nice. Because, yes, they're yucky. And yes, no one wants to do them. But if no one does them, 
Then what? Okay, so do them for the good of the family, sure. But ultimately, do them for Jesus because he is your Lord. And in all things, dishes included, we serve him. Okay, I closed out the introduction to this sermon by asking what on earth is Paul doing here and why? And what we've seen is that Paul isn't overturning the institution of slavery. He's not attacking the system directly. That would be too disruptive and a distraction from the message and cause of the gospel that would ultimately lead to that very system's extinction. In fact, it would give Christ and Christianity in that day and age an unnecessarily bad name were he to do that in that way. Some things are necessary, like insisting that Jesus is Lord and refusing to acknowledge that Caesar is Lord. We're facing them more and more, by the way, today. But Christians rightly went to the mat and to the arena, to their death, for that. Some things like that are necessary. Other things are not. Keep your eye on the main thing, even as you work for better things. So he isn't overturning the system or attacking it directly, but he is regulating it to become, in practice, among Christians, both slave and master, more honoring to the Lord Christ, and at the same time, by doing so, he is also sowing the seeds for the eventual demise of that entire oppressive system led out from the church. Feel the sting. Let us learn from his approach, even as we seek to walk forward into this fallen world with its broken systems in a tangibly and increasingly tangible Christ-honoring way, with our focus always on him as Lord and his cause as our goal. May the Lord give us both the single-mindedness along with the wisdom and courage to do so. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there is so much more that could be said along these lines and on this subject. Our heads are spinning enough as it is. And we are convicted enough as it is. But we need to be. Help us to repent of the sins of our past as we move forward seeking righteousness in the future. Let's, let us be a part of that movement, not a part of either embracing or glossing over what is evil before you. And at the same time, Lord, we also walk in the fallenness and brokenness, where we will be abused, where we, where we will suffer oppression, where we will be maligned and used as tools or as throwaway notes. Help us to walk forward into that knowing that we serve you. And that is the most elevating and liberating thing of all. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close out, I would like us to sing a couple of bluegrass songs, one of which, by the way, is actually an old Negro spiritual that became bluegrass. So we're going to sing on, I'm working on a building, and it doesn't sound at all like a Negro spiritual. That's because Bill Monroe bluegrass. Uh, but it actually was originally. But it's really fun. So Stan, we're going to sing that one, and then in the highways and the hedges, which we've sung a couple times before, you should know that. Oh, it's in the insert in your worship. You guys ready? Yeah. I'm working on the building. I'm working on the
intent, that's the word, intention, on your hearts. May the Holy Spirit fill you and empower you to do that task. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his face upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore a peace that makes a mark. Yes. Bind us together, Lord, bind us. Like some bluegrass music.